Say hi, Mackenzie. No, <laughs> you say hi to everybody. You blow my kiss? All right. One of the many perks of recording a sermon from home. So as you could tell, I'm coming to you pre-recorded from the Swithin residence. I, I will say recording sermons um, quadruples your work. One time it took me a day and a half to upload a sermon to YouTube. It's a lot of fun, let me tell you. Um, but it's not all negative. Some of the perks of recording from your home, obviously, get to be with Princess Cupcake Face. But uh, one of the main perks is that uh, you only see me from the waist up, which means I get to preach God's word um, in my bunny rabbit slippers. These things are incredibly comfortable. In fact, I'm pretty sure that um, I'm able to preach better uh, when I wear these things. That's the truth. So, true story to get us kicking for today. I'm not embellishing the facts of this story in any way, shape, or form. Uh, this happened about six weeks ago, and it involves not a skunk. It involves a stunk, because that's what my daughter Mackenzie calls it. So, um, I looked outside from my bedroom window and noticed that I had indeed trapped a skunk in our trap. Uh, they've been all over our property, and uh, so I do my best to get rid of that problem. And my daughter overheard me telling my wife that we trapped one. So she said, Daddy, I want to go see the stunk. So I proceed to take my amazing daughter down to the trap where she could see the stunk. And she looks up at me with her perfect angelic little puppy dog eyes and she says daddy i love the stunk i knew i was in really big trouble at this point so um we proceeded to stare at the stunk in the cage and i'm wondering in my mind what i'm going to do at this point and she looks back up at me with the same eyes and she says daddy can we let the stunk go and at this point, um, I melted and decided it would be best if Pepe Le Pew was released from his jail cell. And uh, that way uh, I could make my daughter happy. So I sneak over to the cage and prop it open with a stick. I run back over to my daughter. I hold on to her as we smile and giggle, waiting for the stunk to exit its jail cell. After about five minutes of it not leaving its jail cell, this is where it gets good, I decided to get a stick and go around to the back of the cage and poke the stunk in the butt from behind a bush. I'm thinking, you know, this bush is pretty thick. Uh, there's no way it can get me. Um, I poked it one time to try to get it to leave its jail cell and it sprayed me in the eyeball and in my mouth like a lot like not just a little bit a lot in fact uh, my daughter saw me running well sprinting towards the house so that I could wash my eye out because I was pretty sure uh, I was going to lose sight in my left eye. It felt pretty similar to uh, the CS gas that we used in the Marine Corps to qualify in, uh, in uh, gas masks and in, uh, in suits. It was pretty painful. And, uh, and so now my daughter, uh, partially traumatized, uh, she says with the same puppy dog eyes, she says, Daddy, I don't like stunks. So, true story, I can officially say that I survived a skunk spray in the mouth and, uh, and in the eye. In fact, 
Uh, two weeks later, I was climbing Hossack Peak with some teenagers, and I was breathing heavy for like three hours, and it jarred something loose in my lungs. Like I tasted skunk for the whole time that I was climbing Hossack Peak. Uh, it was like it jarred it loose in my lungs and was coming up. Uh, in fact, I still sometimes smell it just randomly around the house. And I don't think it's in the house. I think it's like still stuck to the scar tissue in my nose or something. So traumatic experience. You're thinking, well, what's the moral of that story? Uh, the moral of the story, listen carefully. This is really theological. Uh, I, Eric David Swithin, am not the brightest crayon in the box. Just going to put it out there. Can I get an amen? That should be enough time. I'm sure I got lots of amens on that one. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. See, I believe with all of my heart. I don't just believe. I know. I know that I know that I know that God called me here. He placed me in a position as youth pastor of Center Point Church, uh, to pour into the lives of the teenagers in this town, not just our own church, but in this town in general, and also to lead those that are also pouring into teenagers. Uh, the fact is I am not special. <laughs> uh, in fact, I actually think I'm probably an unlikely, unlikely candidate for this job. Um, I mean, if you think about it, um, I'm pushing 40 years old. Uh, my ping pong skills are diminishing rapidly. And I still dress like a skater slash surfer from the early 2000s. I don't necessarily fit the bill of a youth pastor, right? Um, and so my argument is that there's absolutely no explanation uh, for what has happened in the youth ministry in this town, uh, in this church other than it's the miraculous power of God. All of it. I might as well just be a donkey, an instrument that God has been able to use. Uh, <laughs> after a youth conference, I was asked to be the keynote speaker at up in Canada. I brought some teenagers from the church with me. Um, I gave an evangelistic message. At the end, I, I offered a chance for kids to come up. We had I don't know, 40, 50, maybe more uh, teenagers who gave their life to God. And so I was talking to one of my spiritual mentors, one of my spiritual fathers about this. And I said, man, I said, I can't believe that even a single kid stood up and responded to the altar call. And this was his response. Listen, <laughs> he said, Eric, I've heard you preach and you're not that good. <laughs> I can't believe that that many kids stood up either. And so, I'll be honest, I think it's the Lord, 100%. Anything and everything that's good that's come out of the youth ministry from Centerpoint has been the Lord. It's been what He's done. <laughs> We're trying our best to obey Him and follow through with what He asks us to do. And so today, uh, I don't want to boast in me. I don't want to come across that way. I don't want to brag on Eric or what Eric's doing or any of that garbage um, because that's all it is, filthy rags. Uh, I want to boast in the Lord. I want to boast in my weakness so that the power of God would dwell in me because we know that God's power is perfected in weakness. So all the more I boast in the fact that I... More and more, I mean, I might have a nice looking resume, but the truth is, I am nothing. It's the power of God, and it's through my weakness that his strength and his power exudes, and we begin to see fruit, we begin to see things happen. In fact, an encouragement for all of us, I believe that it's actually my lack of confidence and trust in myself, coupled with my overwhelming confidence and trust in Jesus, that is why I believe God has chosen me for this mission, and I believe he's calling all of us to do the same, to rely upon him and trust in him and not ourselves in any way. So I want to boast in him today. I want to brag about what I've seen him do in this community, 
so far this summer and I'm excited to share with you some cool stuff that is absolutely miraculous. Uh, but first, God's given me a word. He's given me a message to share with you. It's, I think, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. I believe it with all my heart. I've seen it put to action, and I've seen the fruit that comes from it. I think it's a perfect message for today, and it serves as a reminder to most of us because I, I'm pretty sure almost every single person that listens to this is going to say, well, duh, yep, we know that already. But it's good to be reminded. It's good to be encouraged. And I believe in what I'm saying right now because I believe it's from the Lord um, more than I ever have before, especially after what we've been seeing this summer. So I want to share with you the beauty of Jesus' heart. I call this the heart of Jesus. If we could really understand his heart and his love, maybe even a little more than we do, what would we glean from it? What would we take away from it? What would it look like? What's his love for broken people, for people in general? And so I wanted to start with what I think is God's strategy. What strategy has he given Centerpoint Church? What strategy has he given the youth ministry that we're in collaboration with other ministries here in Pagosa? Most ministries here in Pagosa. So... Strategy, first, we pray. We beg God to give us his heart for the lost. We beg God to save souls. We pray by name for our kids, our students, the youth of Pagosa. We pray that God would raise up leaders disciple makers, partners, to collaborate in the mission of pursuing the hearts of our youth. We beg him. So instead of talking about it, how about we be about it? So please bow your heads with me. Let's go before the Father and ask him for these things. Our most gracious, perfect, amazing Heavenly Father, would you break our hearts for the lost, for the broken, for the last, for the poor in spirit, for the sick, for the hurting, for the orphans, the widows, the fatherless. Would you break our hearts for what breaks yours? I know that's a scary thing to pray, Lord, but we, we want it. We want to see people the way you see them and we want to pursue them with a ferocious love that can only come from you we pray for our youth right now lord we are around the world around the country in so many places we're losing ground the culture is sucking the life out of our kids and distracting them dividing them drawing them away from their faith and God, we need something new, something fresh, something bold, something radical. So we beg you, Lord, by your power, not by our wits, but by your power, that you would give a deep-seated revelation to every single youth in this town, every single youth in this nation, and around the world, that you would raise up a new generation of radical followers of you. And help us, Lord, to participate in what you're doing, to get on board. That there would be unity in the body as we all pursue the lost together for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, first part of the strategy is prayer. Constant prayer. God, please give us a heart for the lost. Then... Number two, instead of an entertainment-based ministry uh, where we provide a bunch of extracurricular church activities, we're so stinking good at programs. We're great at it. We're good at teaching the Bible. We're good at playing games. We're good at serving pizza. It's not working. 
it hasn't worked for many years. The enemy is winning ground. Our strategy has to be new and fresh. So we're constantly asking the Lord, please, if, if your hand isn't in this thing, remove it, change it, update it, revamp it, bring new leaders in, cancel the whole thing. Let's do something new and fresh. So it's not about providing a bunch of extracurricular church activities. Instead, we invite youth into ministry work. We show them what it means to be on fire to be an on-fire disciple of Jesus who can be a change agent for whatever realm of influence God might put them in the future. An accountant, a mechanic, a professor, a minister, flipping burgers, that they'd be a missionary wherever they're planted. I would rather watch paint dry uh, eat celery, which but no one should ever eat celery, ever. It's disgusting. I don't think God intended it to be a food. I'd rather stab my eyeballs with a pencil than to foster lukewarm Christians and the youth that God's placed in my care. One of the greatest compliments I've received recently was criticism from a parent. I was called a cult leader and asked what I had done to their kid, and I quote, uh, Eric, my kid's taking this Jesus thing way too seriously. <laughs> I said, thank you. That's awesome. That's what we're hoping for. So the difference is this. Uh, we don't invite them to our ministry. Maybe at first we do, but our long-term goal is to invite them to be part of working in the ministry. Our goal is scriptural. We seek to equip them for the work of the ministry, not merely, merely to be a good church attender. I believe that this is God's mission for Centerpoint Church. I believe that we are commissioned to make disciples, all Christians are, but I believe our church is called to be a disciple-making factory. I believe the Lord wants us to be exceptional at it. I desire for every teenager we pour into to fall madly in love with Jesus and dedicate their lives to serving him. Put differently, I believe that Jesus desires for us to adopt his heart for the people of this world so we can partner with him to change it. It's not just about being in relationship with Jesus in our communication. It's about being in relationship with Jesus in his mission. You see, we are not going to change this culture uh, or this country or this world through our elections by military force, civil war, social media, protesting. Now, we might slow things down, speed things up, but we're not going to change the world that way. It's, it's not biblical. Those strategies are not biblical. In fact, I would say they are anti-evangelical. In that, they don't draw people to Christ. Most of the time, they repel people from Christ. It's not a good fishing for man strategy. It's the wrong lure, the wrong pole, the wrong reel, the wrong boat. Probably even the wrong lake. In his book, The Evangelical Recession, John Dickerson argues, using copious amounts of data, that the future of the evangelical church looks really grim. As of 2014, only one in 10 Americans are evangelical Christians or identify as such. 65 to 85% of teens, as we know, leave their faith when they leave home for college or the workforce. Another statistic, one third of Christians between the ages of 18 and 29 they never leave their faith. So after high school, they stand strong. One third. So if you have three kids, one of them will stand strong through those formative years. We're seeing that the teenage years leading up dictate their 20s and what they choose to do. And those are the formative years. 
18 to 29 really determines what the course of the rest of their life looks like. One third of those Christians eventually return to Jesus. So they fall away. If you have three kids, one of them will fall away. And then in their 30s or 40s, will most likely return to their faith, but they're going to return with deep wounds, addictions, and they're going to have far less fervency than those that never left. One third, so if you have three kids, one of your kids will fall away from the faith after they leave home and they will never return. One of your kids never leaves. One of them leaves the faith and returns, but beat up. And another third, that third kid, never returns to the faith. We can't keep doing things the way they've always been done. Uh, something's broken, something's not working, something has to change. Kendra Dean from Princeton, she's an academic, and in a research paper on why American teens are falling away from God so rapidly, she concluded that it's happening because teens are being exposed to lukewarm, nominal Christianity. They are not being exposed to radical Christianity. They are used to an entertainment-based Christianity instead of a Christianity that costs them something. They're accustomed to a serve-me Christianity rather than a how-can-we-serve-others Christianity. John Dickerson says, we will never ever change the culture out there until God changes our hearts first. We have to go a mile deep before we can ever go an inch wide or a mile wide. See, I believe that once we experience a deep, deep communion with Jesus, he will unleash us onto the world. Like firefighters running towards a burning building, we will be spiritual warriors that run towards suffering and brokenness saying, how can I help? What can I do? It's a natural byproduct of being connected to Jesus in relationship. So this radical Christianity that Kendra Dean says we need to expose our youth to starts with deep intimacy with Christ. And, and what follows naturally is a hunger to share that love with the world. Essentially, the heart of Jesus becomes our heart. By becoming Christ-like, we're better able to see people the way Jesus sees people and to have compassion towards people the way Jesus has compassion for them. Jesus does not say, follow me and let's study systematic theology. His call is a personal call of intimacy that leads us to follow him into the trenches. It is in the spiritual trenches that we find the kingdom of God manifesting into this reality. And when I say manifesting into this reality, I mean serving the lost becomes something we are compelled to do. We're inwardly driven to serve the widow, the orphan, the fatherless, the sick, the hungry, the broke. Glimpses of God's heaven are reflected in the here and now. This all stems from an overflow of the love God gives us. It inspires us to lay ourselves down for him and for others. Jesus says in Luke 9, 23 to 25, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. They must take up their electric chair and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very soul? Our youth are not exposed to radical Christianity because our youth programs, our churches, our average evangelical Christian in America, they're not willing to literally pour themselves out and sacrifice everything in pursuit of the heart of Jesus, in relationship with Jesus, and then out of that overflowing into the service that God calls us to. Making disciples, pouring into those in need. In the last chapter of the book of Titus, the book of Titus, highly recommend. I think it's super relevant right now. The book of Titus is so relevant to Center Point Church right now. The Apostle Paul, in that book, writing to Titus, concludes 
with what Dr. John MacArthur says is a summary of some of the most important instructions for the local church, especially today. So Titus 1, 1 to 2 says, be ready to do whatever is good. And then later, Titus 3, 14 says, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. In Hebrews 13, 16, it mirrors, mirrors this same theme when it says, don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Don't forget to do good and share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. See, this call to do what is good in order to provide for the urgent needs of others is intimately tied to the Great Commission to go make disciples. We see this same model throughout Scripture. Jesus took care of real needs first, then came repentance and restoration. Paul did the same. We're called to emulate this model. Let me save you, adulterous woman, from being stoned to death. Let me save your life, a very real need. Let me save your life right now. And then once I've done that and proven my love, proven how much I've care, I care for you, then what do I say? Go from here. Don't sin anymore. Stop it. Repent. We see this model again and again and again. When we demonstrate the love of God by taking care of real needs, it provides opportunities to share the gospel. We do it out of love, not just a sneaky ulterior motive to share the gospel. We do it because we love the person we're helping, because God loves them. And it just so happens that a byproduct is we get a chance to share the gospel. More importantly, it provides opportunities. It opens up spiritual conduits for God to move in the hearts of the person whose needs, were being, uh, whose needs are being filled. James 1, 22 to 25 says that we shouldn't just read scripture. We should also do what it says. Similarly, in our ministry, as we equip disciples, train up disciples, we shouldn't just teach them scripture. We should model it in our holiness and in our service. God says, be holy for I am holy. So as disciple makers, we should be saying, not just, hey, let me sit down and teach you the Bible, but hey, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm not going to just teach you what the scripture says. We're going to go do it. By doing this, we expose our teenagers to legitimate, on fire, passionate, sacrificial Christianity. They get their hands dirty serving others. Simultaneously, they're being taught and shown scripture. They're seeing it come to life. They're seeing the great purpose of God. They're seeing that we can do something. In fact, we are the greatest change agent in the world. The church is God's hands and feet to change the world. There's nothing more powerful than the church of God to change the world. Nothing. If we do it correctly. So during the month of June, uh, hopefully, uh, some of you noticed that I wasn't around much. Uh, I was leading backpacking trips uh, in the wilderness with a ministry called Outdoor Adventures. They seek to erase the fatherless epidemic through mentorship. Uh, Outdoor Adventures is one of the main ways we expose our youth to missions work. And I can say I've done it both ways. I've done short-term mission trips to Mexico. I lived in Costa Rica for a bit. Uh, we fundraised $55,000 in a few months here in uh, Center Point Church here in Pagosa Springs so that we could go to Kenya. There was 13 of us. We ended up not making it, uh, but we were going to be in country for like a week. So $55,000 to be there for like a week, helping build homes for those that need it. They didn't need us to be there to build the homes. They had people to do that, but it was for us, for our exposure to something new, something fresh, what God's doing, service, mission. And so I'm not knocking short-term mission trips. I'm just saying uh, through Outdoor Adventures and through other ministries right here in Pagosa, down in Dulce, New Mexico, um, they're, they're actually right here in our backyard. In fact, we've brought up tons of kids from the inner city this summer, and then we've exposed our youth here in town, those that stepped up and, and wanted to be a part of that, 
we've exposed them to that mission. It's like a mission trip here. It's been absolutely beautiful. And here's what God has to say in his scriptures about that specific mission. Uh, James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. See, we need to be like our Father in heaven who, according to Deuteronomy 10.18, says, defend the cause of the fatherless and the widow and love the foreigner that lives among you. Provide them with food and clothing if they need it. In Psalm 35.10, it says, well, David says, My whole being will exclaim, Who is like you, Lord? You rescue the poor from those too strong for them, the poor and needy from those who rob them. God the Father has adopted us. We've been adopted into the family of God. He's fed us restored us, saved us, met our needs, and he continues to prepare a place for us in heaven. One of the most exciting promises. So let us partner with him and take care of the very real needs that surround us. And let's take those we are discipling, namely our youth, along with us as we do that. Come with me. Let's volunteer at Aspire, a health and pregnancy center right here in Pagosa Springs. Hey, come with me. We're going to go down to Dulce, New Mexico. I hate to say it, no offense to anybody, but Dulce, New Mexico needs a move of God like almost any other place I've seen in third world countries, in the inner city. It needs a move of God. Who better to do it than us and to bring our youth with us as we do it, to expose them to radical Christianity. The good news is that so many of the members of Centerpoint Church, other churches too in Pagosa Springs, but Centerpoint Church has rolled up their sleeves and participated and what God is doing in this town and around the world. The family of God, when I look at it, functioning as it should. The body of Christ, all using their gifts and talents simultaneously. It's like this beautiful orchestra. All serving in unison to make an eternal music that's pleasing to the Lord. I know that sounds kind of weird and poetic, but think about it. Everybody running around in love, using their gifts and talents and energy and resources together in collaboration, in unity, in unity, in unity to serve those in need out of an overflow of love that the Father gives them. Woo. And that music, that orchestra demonstrates God's amazing love. The world gets to see it on display, and it's beautiful and undeniable. In fact, the Bible says the world will know us as Christians. They'll recognize us because of the way we love one another. So that unity piece is key. And I love seeing it. And ultimately, it leads the lost towards salvation. I've watched rich people, monetarily wealthy, poor Young, old, man, woman, people from different backgrounds and races, countries, roll up their sleeves in this church and other churches here in Pagosa. I've seen them sweep floors, do laundry, fix broken air conditioning units, donate money, cook food, If you haven't had Connie Davidson's or Marie Rasco's baked goods, you need to ask God to forgive you, and then you need to get on that. I've watched people teach the Bible to our youth, 
worship God on stage using their musical gifts and talents, volunteer their time at Aspire, serve food at Loaves and Fishes, pay for the medical expenses of those who can afford it, unofficially adopt the fatherless and pour into them as spiritual mothers and fathers, cry with those that are mourning the loss of a loved one, boldly share the gospel in public settings. I have seen such beautiful, beautiful things. And all of that, from the person who donates $5 to the person who cooks a cake to the person who washes bed sheets. At the end of that collaborative, beautiful orchestra, out pops the fruit of what God's power produces. So a couple of a quick testimonies. So uh, we, out in the middle of the wilderness, one of my leaders and I got to embrace a weeping, I mean crying so hard he couldn't breathe, 350 pound, 17 year old black boy from the inner city who's a leader, a shot caller in the gang called the Bloods. He's a drug dealer. And the power of God got a hold of him in the darkness of night at 11.30 p.m., way out in the middle of the wilderness. And he grabbed a hold of me and, and my boy and just collapsed in our arms as he weeped, as God touched his heart. That's one of many stories. Uh, one of my newly unofficially adopted sons, Carson, a boy who almost took his own life in front of his family. He lost his father to a disease a couple of years ago. His mother adopted three more kids, two of which have disabilities. This kid was on the precipice of ending up dead or in prison. I watched that kid not only give his life to Jesus, uh, we also had the opportunity to baptize him. And we got to bring youth from Pagosa, youth from Centerpoint, into that experience. They got to watch him weep as he shared his story for two hours until three in the morning or two in the morning, whatever it was, around a campfire. A story that you just can't make up. That's the type of stuff our youth have been exposed to this summer. Um, we've had at least nine baptisms. We have two more scheduled uh, for this month. Um, I could say that we have m more than one student who've been served by Aspire Pregnancy Center. One in particular did not graduate high school. The Lord's been tugging on her heart for the whole time I've been in Pagosa for three years now. And um, I remember what she said to me. She still does not know the Lord, but man, I believe she's getting close. She said when she went to Aspire, she said she felt at home. She felt so comfortable and that there was just this strange and peaceful spirit about the place. I said, yeah, that's the Lord. That's, that's him. Man, talk about seeds planted. Uh, this summer, uh, we saw lots and lots of salvations. Despite COVID-19 and all of everything getting shut down, uh, our work, you can ask Bart or PJ or Forrest, our work has quadrupled. It hasn't gotten easy. This hasn't been a time for rest. It just means that we've had to do more in smaller groups. So instead of shutting down, we have done a whole lot, but with a lot of small groups doing our best to continue the discipleship process. Um, it was my pleasure to see a whole army of God's people mobilized to make all of this possible. So many people gathered around me and the other leaders and supported us. It was, it was so encouraging and beautiful. Thank you. With all of my heart, with the utmost humility and sincerity, thank you, thank you, thank you for your support for jumping on board what God's doing. And, um, and I love you. I love you. I love you. I love seeing God's body at work. A couple of testimonies 
from uh, some that have really been involved in the different ministries in Center Point Church. This one, uh, she uh, allowed me to say her name. This is from Megan Castaneda. She wrote a little letter that I just want to read to you really quickly. It's so beautiful. She said, over the past several years, I have been so blessed to be a part of and to see God's work in amazing ways through ministry and in my own life. I could probably write a short book on my experiences seeing God move in and through people, events, situations, prayer, and me. Most recently, I had the privilege of working as a clinic assistant at Aspire, our local pregnancy crisis center. And it is no accident that I ended up there. I am blessed beyond belief to be a part of the staff and volunteer group at Aspire. God has allowed me to work at a place where we pray for our clients, meet them where they're at, love them, and are able to be the light of Jesus to them. I have had opportunities to pray with clients, to see abortion-minded women decide to keep their babies. You think that's close to the heart of Jesus? To be a listening ear and build relationships and have been amazed at answered prayers, whether it be for specific lab results that enable great conversations or for opportunities to speak truth into their lives. I watch volunteers meet with clients that have had built, that have built lasting relationships with and diligently pray for. And I'm so grateful for those who have come to know Jesus as a result. God has impacted so many lives through this ministry, mine included. I've been inspired by the amazing godly women that I work with, and I'm still in awe of how God got me to aspire in the first place. The work that God has done in the lives of people that walk through the door is incredible. God has given me more compassion and understanding for those in need as a result of the work that is done there. Marcy Mitchell, well done. Megan Castaneda, well done. Those of you that have been on board um, the Aspire train, I can tell you from my end, I know a whole lot of teenagers who you have blessed and led either led them to the Lord or led them closer to the Lord. You've demonstrated an unconditional, beautiful love. Well done. Megan continues. She says, I've also been a part of the youth ministry at Center Point for the past couple of years. God has given me such a heart and passion for teenagers. This is true. I have had the privilege of watching my kids grow stronger in their faith through the youth ministry, and I'm so grateful for the amazing mentors who pour into their lives through one-on-one discussions, small discipleship groups, retreats, outdoor adventures, walkabout, and prayer. I'm inspired by the love and dedication that they have for not only my kids, but for all the students involved in the youth ministry and our entire community. God has been working in amazing ways through our leaders and youth in Pagosa. I have been moved to tears watching middle school and high school students worship on their knees, hands raised, Spirit-filled. And I'm in awe of how many teens have given their lives to Jesus, including specific ones that I've prayed hard for. God has given me so much joy working with amazing leaders and amazing students, and I feel so blessed to get to witness the incredible things that he's doing through this ministry. My kids and I have been inspired to seek and know God on a deeper level and to pray for, be an example to, and actively disciple others. What a joy it is to serve our incredible God. And well done, Megan. I I can say you've been an unbelievable encouragement to us. And what I love is how you bring your kids into whatever it is that we're doing. You get your hands dirty right alongside them. And um, I see the difference in their lives for sure. And Sam, Jasmine, and Jacob, I love you with all my heart. You guys are amazing. And I just love how supportive you've been and how plugged in you've been. Thank you. This is from someone anonymous here in our church family, someone who's very, very dear to me. We just wanted to take this time to share what a blessing it has been to witness God moving in amazing ways through the youth ministry at Center Point Church. The number of lives of our youth that Jesus has touched is truly wonderful. I've enjoyed participating in, participating in, and witnessing other adults that have been included in this ministry. It is a beautiful picture of how the church should look and how it should function. We're so thankful for the impact God has had on our daughter's life. Your support and vulnerability have made her feel loved, accepted, and not alone. 
Your passion for fatherless boys is contagious, and the idea that Centerpoint and our youth could catch this passion is exciting. James 1.27 says, we read this earlier, but it's worth reading 15 more times. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God is this to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Thank you so much that this is lived out by the two of you. It's talking about my amazing woman, Cameron, and for including center point in your pure and undefiled religion. God obviously has great things planned for his kingdom to be accomplished through this ministry in Christ. And so again, I am a nobody, I'm just a donkey, God gets all the credit and all the glory, we praise his holy name for what he's doing and changing lives, continuing to use this community to make a difference, and um, I couldn't be more enthusiastic, more excited, more optimistic about what's to come as we continue to move forward. And here's my challenge for you. Uh, this comes from my friend Jim Sanderson. He helps run the whole One Church Pagosa movement here in Pagosa Springs to bring unity to the body of Christ for the glory of God and the service of others. He says, fellow Christian, who are you discipling this week? If you're not discipling someone right now, you are wasting your time. You are wasting your time. So I commend the family of God for all their efforts and all their participation, all the collaboration, all the service, all the generosity. And those of you that may not be on that train yet, I just want to encourage you. I want to actually encourage every single person here. What is your gift? What is your talent? And so here's your homework in assessing that and what God would have you do in the great commission work that we're doing here in Pagosa and around the world. So here's your homework. Number one, I want you to study the Bible for the next week with this question in mind. What does God want me to do with my time, energy, and resources? Ask that question. Pray and study God's word. What would he have you do with your time, energy, and resources? Number two, pray with this question in mind. What is God's specific mission for me? And how do I live that out through the church? The body of Christ with all its various members and parts and gifts and talents. And talents. Where do I fit into that? Pray and ask the Lord to reveal that to you. Number three, how does that mission support and contribute to the Great Commission? To go and make disciples of every tongue, every tribe, every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God says, I'll be with you always. But that was his final instruction. That's our job. So where does God want you to use your gifts and talents? And how does that contribute to the body of Christ, the church, in fulfilling the Great Commission? And number four, I want you to ask, is there an existing opportunity where you can leverage your gifts and your talents and live out the calling God has for you in contributing to the Great Commission right now. So in other words, what I'm asking is, I don't encourage you to invent a new wheel. Every other day, someone wants to start something new. There's not the resource or the people to run it. We have amazing things already in operation that need as many people as possible to come around them. So that's the fourth thing I want you to ask this week is, is there already something out there? Aspire, cooking food, working with orphans, assisting widows in our community, fixing cars like Max so kindly does so often for those that are in need. Whatever your gift and your talent is, how you can plug that into what already exists. Whether it's chopping firewood, making a meal, or preaching the gospel, working with the youth, whatever it is. I want uh, those four things to be on our hearts and our minds this week as we continue to ask God, how do we expose our youth to radical Christianity? How do we move the ball forward 
with the Great Commission, how do we do it as a family of God that is, is unified, full of light and full of love, especially in these precarious times? I love you. I am so thankful for the opportunity to get to share my heart with you this morning. Um, I have sweat rolling down my back profusely because of how passionate I am and how hot it is. And I hope that some of that was contagious. I hope that the power of God was able to use a donkey to stir you up, spur you on, encourage you, and get you pumped up and excited about what he's doing. I love you. I'll talk to you soon. Hopefully we won't have masks on and we'll be able to hug in the very near future. Something I hope and pray for. Bye-bye.